الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله وسلامه عليه أما بعد جزاكم الله خيرا May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward the organizers and the brothers who helped in putting this conference and series of talks together. Alhamdulillah ala ni'matil islam wa sunnah. All praise and thanks belong to Allah for guiding us to Islam and for guiding us to the sunnah. This is a ni'mah bila shak wa bila raib. Bithnillahi ta'ala before we begin, there is a, a slight issue that I wanted to speak about. But in that, bithnilahi ta'ala, it will establish a good foundation, meaning a reminder for us of our foundation as individuals who are striving to cling to the Quran and the Sunnah of Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as understood by the Salaf of this Ummah. Firstly, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala He tells us in His Noble Book Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ati'u allaha wa ati'u al-rasul wa ulu amri minkum O you who believe Obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those who are in authority over you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes on to say, fi shay. And if you differ in anything, fi shay'in, in anything, فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِ So return it back to Allah and to the Messenger, وَالرَّسُولِ and to the Messenger. And this is our foundation, that whenever there are differences of opinions, whenever there is a difference in a matter of the deen, then we return it back to Allah and to his messenger, so to get the ruling. Naam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us, in kuntum tu'minuna billahi wa yawm al-akhir, that that is if you truly believe in Allah in the last day. That if we truly believe in Allah in the last day, then we return our affairs when we differ back to the book of Allah and to the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as understood by the salaf of this ummah. This is salafiyyah. Allah ta'ala, he says, ذَلِكَ khair. This is good. ذَلِكَ khairun. This is good. Meaning, in every which way, shape, and form. That you will find in this good and this is the best of final determinations and this is our way this is our methodology this is our foundation so with that being the case we also see as Allah Ta'ala he says elsewhere in his noble book and no in O by your Lord لا يؤمنون حتى يحكموك فيما شجر بينهم. They do not believe until they utilize you, O Muhammad, صلى الله عليه وسلم, as a judge in those things, those issues that arise amongst between them, those issues in which individuals they are differing about its ruling, its application, so on and so forth. Then we return it back to the Sunnah of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم وطبعا على فهم السلف أمة. And of course, upon the understanding of the Salaf of this Ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes that this is the way of the believers. And some of the ulama they mention, as relates to this ayah, they say that if something comes up, if something comes about, and you find in yourself any type of discrepancies, and you find within yourself any type of differing as relates to what Allah ta'ala mentions next, then go back and check your iman. Check your iman. Because Allah Ta'ala, He says, and no, by your Lord, they don't truly believe until they utilize you as a judge in those things that arise amongst them. 
ثم لا يجدوا في أنفسهم حرجا and then they don't find within themselves any type of difficulty they don't find within themselves any type of kalam any type of difficulty مما قبيت from what you have ruled O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم ويسلموا تسليما and they submit to it completely سمعنا وطعنا this is our way this is our foundation Allah Ta'ala said it's like this, it's like that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it's like this, it's like that. This was the way of the Salaf, then that's it. We don't look for any type of any alternatives or any things of this nature. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He says elsewhere in His book, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا يَكُنُ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ that it is not befitting for a believing man nor for a believing woman that when Allah and His Messenger have ruled on an affair that they have any type of say so as relates to that they have no nothing to say no option except to hear and obey there is no let's talk about it no Allah Ta'ala has ruled this is the way it is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has ruled this is the way it is and whoever disobeys Allah wa Rasulah and his messenger فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا and whoever has disobeyed Allah, and whoever has disobeyed the Prophet وسلم, then they have gone astray. Dalalan. How how what's what's to the extent that they have gone astray? They have gone astray, and they're going astray is mubinan. It's clear. It's not hidden. It's not it's not yani, um, hard to, to, to see. It's not hard to recognize. But they have gone clearly astray. So I'm saying all that to say that. One this is our way, this is our foundation. But two, but two, this is exactly why, as relates to myself, that I am not in agreement in any which way, shape, or form with an institute like the Institute of Yaqeen, who will promote and advocate for Muslims. And there are many calamities of Yaqeen but this is not the time so as to go through their issues but we'll mention one as a clear example so you understand where I'm coming from any type of institution that will advocate for the Muslims that they should support gay marriage or some of if not all of the rights of the LGBT community then this is an organization that it is not in wisdom to work and to cooperate with them at all so I do not agree with those who cooperate with them I do not agree that in it there is wisdom because it is not in my opinion from my estimation it is not from wisdom how could it be from anything except confusion? If one voice says, okay, another voice says, they don't even say anything in opposition to it. So where is the clarity? From our methodology is clarity, wuduh. This is just an example. So for me, no. I don't agree with that institution, nor do I advocate for it, nor do I condone anyone being a, por a part of it for whatever re wisdom that they may see with it that's their wisdom that they see I don't agree with that I don't agree with that and I feel that I have the right to say I don't agree with that because some people they think that it is reserved to have an opinion for is reserved for some and not for others some individuals they are beyond reproach and, and everyone else they are open for criticism I don't believe that. That is not my way. So I don't, I don't agree with anything of that nature. So let that be known. Let that be said. Let that be clear. Any subsequent question that may be related to that issue or anyone dealing with that, you already have my answer. Correct? Or no? Is that, is that, is that, is that clear? Or is it ambiguous? Is it clear? Walden. Walden, right? All right. So you know my stance. Anyway, we live in a time of yeah, tremendous trials and tribulations. 
the Prophet he told us it was going to be like this. Whoever lives from amongst you, they're going to see much differing, much ikhtilaf. So it is binding upon you to stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly got a khulafa after me to the end of the hadith. So we know that there's going to be a lot of differing and thus we are witness to much differing in the deen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only did he tell us what was to come so that we may be prepared for it and act accordingly when we see it and be upon the guidance in which he has given us and directives that he has given us so as to navigate it. But he has also told us the end result of those individuals who came before us so that we may take a lesson from it, so that we don't fall into what they have fallen into and so that we know how to maneuver when people of our time also fall into the likes of these things. And from that is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغُلُوءُ فِي الدين. Beware of extremism in the religion. Beware of extremism in the religion. فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ الْغُلُوءُ فِي الدين. Because verily what destroyed those who have come before you, the nations that came before you, they were destroyed by what? By having exaggeration, by having extremism in the religion by having extremism in the religion man so this is key right now because as was announced the topic and the theme of this talk that i have prepared then it is dealing with those characteristics of al hadadiyya that people mistake for salafiyya man so to better understand so that we know the difference and we can make a, yani a differentiation between this and between that, then we have to familiarize ourselves with some of the Haddadi characteristics. So I want you to understand very clear. And this is a continuation of lectures and of talks that I have done in the past on this very same topic certain traits and characteristics of the Haddadi. So I want to make it clear that the characteristics that I'm mentioning, these are Haddadi characteristics. Right? You with me? I want to make sure the premise is well established. These, I'm speaking about Haddadi characteristics. So when you find these same characteristics prevalent amongst some people who say that they are Salafi, then know that they are afflicted with Haddadi characteristics. But that these characteristics have nothing to do with a Salafiyya. Nothing to do with a Salafiyya at all. But because of so many individuals who openly proclaim Salafiyya, because they have been trialed and tested and afflicted with some of these characteristics, People have mistaken these characteristics and have taken it for Salafiyya. That makes sense? Okay. So, one of the known characteristics of the Haddadiyya, then it is al ghuluf al Deen. The extreme, the extremist. They have extremism in the religion. This is and characteristic that is a hallmark of the Haddadiyya, of those who are the followers of Al Haddad. Al Haddadiyya, Nisba ila Mahmoud, Al Haddad, Al Masri. Haddadiyya, they are called the Haddadis, right? Because they are linked to Mahmoud, Al Haddad, the Egyptian. So this is why they're called Haddadi. Naam? And this is not a connection or a nisbah that we have given them. This is that in which ulama before us, ulama who we are just following in their footsteps, have given them and what they have called them, Haddadi. So this is why they're called Haddadi, because it links back to this group. Because, and it's very important to know, 
some individuals learn just enough to get themselves in trouble but they don't know enough to fully understand right so when it comes to someone say but there's no such thing as Haddadiyya. Who mentioned a group called Haddadi from the ulama of the past? In reality, they stem from this group and that. Yeah, subhanAllah. Is it your estimation that you're the only one that knows this? Do you not know that way before this, Muhammad al Jami explained to us the origin of this particular man and where they came from? So it's known what they are. But because of the nature and because for clarity's sake and so on and so forth so as to make it known to the people and because of their clear connection and linking back to this particular individual this is why the ulama call them al hadadiyya because they link back to Mahmoud al haddad al masri Naam. and i believe we had we had a talk yesterday about 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 this right abd al gave a background of this particular individual who uh the name it goes back to him because his last name was Al Haddad. They are known for their exaggeration. But as relates to if we had to pin this group down to which group do they find their origin from? Because remember, the groups of innovation they stem and they spring out from known sources, from known wells, right? Wells of evil. One of those wells of evil in which many groups they stem out from was from who? From the Khawarij. Correct? Yeah. Okay. So, Al Alama Muhammad Al Man Al Jami, Rahimullah Ta'ala, he mentions, he says, Mahmoud Al Haddad. Mahmoud Al Haddad. So it's clear who he's talking about, right? Those who they connect the Haddadiyya, yani, they link and they call back to him. He said, Kama qila, kana min jama'at al takfir. He said, just as it has been said, he used to be a member of the Jama'ah. He used to be a member of Jama'ah al Takfir. The Takfiris, Jama'ah al Takfir, who are they? The Khawarij. <laughs> right? So if anyone comes and says, but in reality, the Khawarij, nur min al, min al um, excuse me, in reality, the Haddadiyya, nur min al Khawarij, yeah, of course, no one is arguing that. Right? But the way that they move, has with it enough of a distinction that they have been categorized separately because for example if there was an individual who we would say was a member of Daesh right there was a member of Daesh would the correct description for me to say that he had daddy would you truly understand you understand he got some problems but you understand he has the problems of Daesh no, but if I said this, he's from ISIS. This one's from Daesh. Then you automatically understand. Okay. Now, if someone else comes, like those who have extremism and those and fit these characters that we're talking about, right? And they, and they're speaking about it, Imam Imam al Nawi, Ibn Hajar, and so on and so forth. And I said, who am in Daesh? Would you understand necessarily that I mean that's Haddadi? You would say, okay, I can see that, but. Would it be more clear if I said, who a Haddadi? This is a Haddadi. You will understand better, right? Yeah. You will say, okay, yeah, nah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Those are the ones that are talking about burning books and so on. Right? So for this reason, to make it clear in the least amount of words, this is why the early math, they come up with these uh, or these terms, uh, this jargon, to bring you to an understanding in the, in the quickest way possible. So this is why you have from the early math, those who call him Haddadi, because it's very clear. It's very clear. They're all from the same source of, of, of nonsense, right? But they each have their, their, their little spin on it. They come from their different angles and so on and so forth. Okay? Any, in any event. So the first is al ghulu And this is going to be something repetitive. As you will see that many of these characteristics, they are interchangeable and they link in and they're connected to the next. So in particular, naam, they have ghulu The haddadi. They have ghulu for many things. But the first thing we want to look at is that they have a ghulu fit tabdir with tajrih. They have a ghulu in calling people innovators. Meaning people of the sunnah. Now, and I want to make this clear. People of the sunnah. If a person comes and he says that he's ash'ari. Right? Or if he says he's mu'tazili. He says he's tablighi. And then a person says, okay, they're from Ahl al-Bid'ah. Would you call this ghulu fit tabdir? 
No, because he said he was from there. What do you want me to say? He said he's Tablighi. He's Tablighi. What do you want me to call him? Something different. He's Tablighi. This one said he's Sufi. He's Sufi. Would you like I call him something different? He's Sufi. So when we say Tabdir, what is understood? Making Tabdir of Ahlul Sunnah. Those who are sticking to the Sunnah, clinging to the Sunnah. Those who they origin, they are Salafi. Coming and saying this one? No, he's not Salafi. He's this. Making Tabdir. Removing people. Kicking people out. For lack of a better term, because you can't kick nobody out. But this is what they understand. People understand like this, right? Any of it. Removing people, saying that they are no longer from the Sunnah. They're no longer, they, these people are not Salafi. Yeah, they may say they're Salafi, but they're not. They're not Salafi. This is you call this Tabdir. So anyway, Tabdir with Tajrih. Exaggeration and criticizing people. Exaggeration and criticizing people. But here's the thing, bidun mujib, but without a real reason, without a real reason. Now, the, now, what will make this clearer and better to understand, of course, the more we learn about the, the principles in the Kawa and the Bidara, the Salafiyya, then we will understand better. And I'm saying that just in brief. And there are other places where this was aforementioned. Inshallah ta'ali, we have to go back to those discussions so as to not make this longer than it needs to be. And this is because when I say without a, 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 a real reason or a just reason, is because if a person falls into an innovation, and I mean, I'm not an accusation of an innovation, but a real innovation, do they automatically become a mubtadir? No. No. So the, just the mere of them falling into that innovation, you can't see, you, could you call that as a reason why we make tabdir? No, it's not a reason. So I want to make that clear. Because those of little, little intellect, they will come back and they will say, well, how are you going to say, don't make tabdir, but this person did, and they don't mention one, a, a, a clear mistake, a clear falling into innovation. And they say, but he said a word that agrees with the, the way of the asha'ira. He says something that agrees with the belief of the Asha'ira. How are you going to say he's not an innovator? Because there have been many examples of individuals like this in the past who have fallen into mistakes like this, who the ulama have not said that they are innovators. Individuals who we take from. Individuals who we have their books in the libraries. Individuals who the ulama defend and say no. Because there are protocols. A person just doesn't get thrown outside of the Sunnah because they made a mistake. Sheikh Albani explains this very clearly, and others from the Ulama explain this very clearly. But the Hadadiyya, they have what? Ghulu. Sheikh Al Muhammad Bazmul, he mentioned that the Hadadiyya, they do with Tabdir what the other Khawarij and them do with Takfir. If a Muslim does a major sin, the Khawarij says what automatically? Kafir. Kafir. He fell into the major sin, major sin fell on him, Kafir, automatically. The Haddadiyya, they do the same thing, but with what? Tabdir. A person does something that's clearly bid'ah, clearly bid'ah, they do it. Automatically, what? Muqtadir. But it doesn't work like that for Tekfir, does it? No. And likewise, it doesn't work like that for what? For Tabdir. Because just contradicting the, the way of the Prophet وسلم, will that earn a person hell just by itself? You contradicted the way of the Prophet وسلم, right? Does that earn you hell automatically? No, it doesn't. Now, 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 I'm pretty sure the Haddadis, they looking and saying, well, what you mean? That sounds crazy. This guy's Mumayyir. What you talking about? Okay, what's the proof? What's the proof that just if you just contradict the promise of Islam, it doesn't make you automatically the hell is, is, is for you? What's the proof? Qadin is on proof. It's not, you know. And proof is not because Sheikh so-and-so said. That's not proof. That has never been proof. Proof is qal Allah, qal Rasulullah. Proof is the way of Sahaba. Right? Alright, so what's proof? What's the proof? Anyone know? I'm pretty sure you know. It just may not come to mind. Too many. 
But just one, 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 one that straight to the point. I give you a hint. One man you Ah. Uh. Uh. What's the what's the proof from that right there, that verse? Whoever contradicts the messenger after the proof has been established. Allah Ta'ala didn't say, Well, may you shafi the Rasul. Well, yet tell me, I hate us. No, men badly met me in the After the proof has been established. Why? Because a person could have contradicted the Messenger of Sayyidina Sallam out of ignorance. They didn't know they contradicted the Prophet Sayyidina Sallam. Or because of a tetweed, they thought they were in compliance with the Sunnah of the Prophet Sayyidina Sallam. Because someone lied to them and told them that. So they didn't know. They thought they were doing what was upon what was right. They didn't know. Maybe they were ignorant. Maybe they were lied to. Maybe they were forced. So it's not just because they contradicted. There are nuances. They, they, there's more to it. Right? All right. So just because a person makes a bona fide mistake, that means automatically now, that's it, Muqtadir. Now, one of the overwhelming characteristics of the Hadadiyya is that in lieu of using Muqtadir, they will use Hizbi. They will use a synonym. Hizbi. Right? So these are things that I want to make sure that we are on the same page and we understand. If a person is a Hizbi, could they also be Salafi? No. Because, it, yeah, it's like saying he's a Sufi Salafi. What? No such thing. Right? But could a Salafi have fallen into aspects of Hezbiyah? Of course. How do we understand, or what's one of the things by way in which we understand concepts like this? That a person could have a characteristic of something without full-fledged being that thing. Ahsant. From the hadith of the characteristics of who? Of the munafiq. Just because a person becomes verbally abusive and when they quarrel, does that mean that they're munafiq? No, that means they have a characteristic of nifaq. But it doesn't mean that they're munafiq. So a person can have a characteristic of something without being full blown out that particular thing. But you see, and you have to bear with me because as I mentioned, there are so many things that are interconnected and so many things that will come to mind that I didn't afford prepare for. So those who are taking a list of the characteristics, I apologize. But another characteristic of the Hadadiyya, which is a characteristic of the Khawarij, is that things are black and white. But the Khawarij, Iman, is one thing. Either you have it or you don't. Right? Same with the Murujia. It's just that it translates into different outcomes. One say you have it or you don't, it can go away like that and that's it. The other one say if you have it, Either you have it or you don't, but if you have it, can't nothing affect it. You always have it forever, and that's it. Of course, there are two extremes. Both of them are wrong. But the point is, is that the con concept of the khawarij is that either, e look, man, either you a believer or you not. Ain't no middle ground. Either you, either you, either you with us or you against us. There's no middle ground, right? You see that that gulu, that extremism. Okay, so you find that hadadiya, they have the same type of gulu with them. It's black and white. It's black and white. Well, he did something from Hezbiya? Oh, he Hezbi. He he, well, he did something that, 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 that um, from Bid'ah? Okay, he Mubtadir. Sheikh Muhammad Bazmuli mentions, he says, you have the Hadadiyah, they have, they have degenerated. They have gotten even worse. He said the Hadadiyah from before, they would make Tabdir on a person who actually made a Bid'ah. They actually made a Bid'ah. They would say, this person is Mubtadir. He said the new school hadadiyya, they make tabdir based on the accusation of a bid'ah. Even though these particular bid'ah cannot be defined nor identified. Just the accusation that person falls into issues. That's it, oh hezbi. Right. But if you were to revisit it, what issues? What have they fallen into that translates into them being 
a hizbi mubtada or interacted with and treated with like a hizbi mubtada for what specifically nah he's got issues but what why because they cause trouble but what kind of trouble because they got issues <laughs> Allah Musta'an you can't win you can't win in any event they fall into tabdi' ghuluf tabdi' wa tajrih bidun al mujib so why in kana dhalika and i want you to understand because this takes different manifestations it's not always the same thing sometimes with tabdi' sometimes with tahdhir sometimes it's not tabdi' sometimes they won't they won't come and openly say they're muqtadi' not at first right they'll say other things it's not clear. Later, wall there. Huh? They say ala jada. They say these ambiguous terms. It's not clear. It's not, he's not. He's not upon the upright way. What does that mean? Okay, why? Forget it. Why? Just explain it to me. Why? Why not? Why not upright? Because of what? You know. Then, then it becomes real clear that they have nothing to stand on. But the point is, is that you find it takes various manifestations, and this is the way the people of bid'ah. This is the way the people of Bid'ah in general. And the Hadadiyya, the people of Bid'ah, let's not let, get that twisted. But this is, the, this is their way. Is that they're like, they're like predatory individuals. They're predators. So they don't go to everyone with the same thing. They go to you what they know that they can get away with, with you. And they'll, and they'll talk to you in terms that they think that you will accept. Then they go to others with ways in which they know they can get away with them and talk to them in terms that they can accept. So they may come to you. For example, and they may hint at something, and they may go to someone else who they feel that he's in their circle, and they have dominance over him, and they'll be clear with something, right? So they'll come to you, and they may say he's not clear. They'll go to another one and say, he's a hisbi. You understand? They'll go to you and say, oh, he has weird uh, affiliations. They'll go to another one who they feel is they're more comfortable with, and they'll say, oh, he's a khwani. The two are very different. If, if, if you felt like that here, then why, why'd you say that over there? Right? It's because they know. With this one, I'm going to say, it's not tabdir, it's tahdir. Because they know I can get that off here, you're not going to argue me too much. But with this one, they can come and say, nah, I'm joking, man. I, I don't hate Salafi. They just straight make tabdir. You understand? So they play games like this, so that needs to be known. But they play these type of games. And <clears throat> another manifestation of this game is what they'll tell you don't take knowledge from him don't take knowledge from him subhanallah who who is it who is it that hands down we don't take knowledge from now, and of course we're talking generally there's always exceptions and, and you know but so I don't want you know because you know again man you know I know you got them people going to come back and say no, no, brother, but you know in some circumstances, look at this guy, like he did this, and we still quote from him and all this stuff. It's like, come on, look, you know, talking in general terms, what, what is what we say to the general masses of the people, right? For the general masses of the people, we don't take knowledge from who? The innovator. The innovator. In general terms, the general masses of the people, we don't take knowledge from the innovator, correct? Okay. Are there certain nuances is that for the early mass, students of knowledge, da -da -da, researchers? Yes. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the general masses of the people. Okay, you with me? All right. So, if you come and you say, for example, Sheikh Abdul Razak Al Badr, Allah Taala, they'll say about him what? Don't take knowledge from him. Okay, Sheikh Sulaiman Al Ruhaili, it said about him, don't take knowledge from him. I'm not even going to go on the list. We'll be here to the rest, you know what I mean? The list so long and every day it get more. You understand? No, really. Sometimes some people, you know, you say, man, tell me what's wrong with me. You know what? It's going to be quick if I tell you what's right with you. <laughs> really, sometimes it's like that. Subhanallah. Allah musta'an. But the list goes on. But I'm just saying, we're going to use him as an example. Okay, don't take anything from him. Why? Not taking knowledge from him is equating him to what? Because he's Muqtadeh and we don't take knowledge from him? I ain't saying he's Muqtadeh, but don't take knowledge from him. What? 
What, what, what does that make sense? What do you mean? What's the danger in it? Is it because he's, is it going to misguide me? Is it going to shoot, uh, point me to strange opinions? Is it going to uh, adversely affect my aqidah, my minhaj? And if the answer comes back, well, no, 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 no. Okay, well, then why? Because Sheikh so and so said, well, where's that from Salafiyah? Nowhere. It's not from Salafiyah. But these are some manifestations by way in which you find these things come. But it is not just that. The original Haddadiyya, and these individuals, I know these individuals very well. When I was in Egypt in the late 90s, you had some, you had some individuals running around Tampa who were Haddadi. They were Haddadi. They dressed slightly different from us. A lot of times you find with them at that time for whatever reason, I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't hang around them like that, so I don't, I don't know the reasoning and the thinking. But a lot of times their 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 izad was you know, they head. Their izad was too high. They wear like a real real short thou. The Prophet said that the izad of the of the believer, the izad of the believer, is from the middle. is from the middle of his calf down. You know, to the you know to the top of the ankle or like this. They don't go below the ankle. So you have the you know you have the what you call it? You have the limit. It has to. It can't be under the ankle, and it shouldn't be above the the middle of your calf. But for whatever reason, they would they would I guess try to put it at the middle of the calf, and then I don't know. But it was always a little too high, right? So they was like known for to dress like this. So anyway, from from the way of the Haddadis of old and of, and and the still ones now is that not just they would make tabdir on certain people for reasons that really didn't hold up. But they will also make tabdir on anyone who didn't believe or agree with their tabdir on that person. So they will come and they will say, Imam Ibn Hajar, with us he's Ash'ari Muqtadir. What, what do you say? I will say, no, he's, he's Salafi Sunni. But he said, oh, he can make a mistake like any, anyone else. But he's Sunni as Sheikh Al-Bani mentioned. Is there any proof historically that the Hujjah was established against him? No. The, uh, the environment in which he lived in were not these um, uh, uh, opinions well known and so on and so forth? Yes. The origin and, and, and everything and you know the vast majority of what he called to, they did not comply with the Salafiyyah? Yes. So if a person who you, is clear from their origin, from their works that they are Salafi, but they come up in a you know, an environment that is filled with a whole bunch of crazy stuff, is it inconceivable that maybe they get afflicted with something unbeknownst to them? Because it's so prevalent, it's so well known. It's conceivable. Right? I look like I lost you. That makes sense? You with me? Huh? Okay. So anyway, so the ulama, they say, no, he's, he's Sunni. He's not. He's from the, he's from the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah. But if you said that, They'll turn around and say, okay, even enter Mubtadir. They'll say, okay, then you are Mubtadir. We say he's Mubtadir. You don't say he's Mubtadir, then you Mubtadir too. That's how, they, that's how they take things. And they take the athar, you know, the salaf out of, out, of, out of their proper context and, you know, things like that. Gulu. But this is something that's known about them. So now, I want you to reflect now. The Haddadiyya, you find them the same way. The new school Haddadiyya, the same way. Is that if you don't agree with them in their assessment of a particular individual based upon reasons in which may not add up to what they say it translates into, if you don't believe, then you automatically become what? What's the word they like using a lot? Hezbi. <laughs> he said op. Hell, I was tired. The younger, the younger kids, millennials in them, they say that. But I'm just saying what you say? Hezbi. A joke of Hezbi. Right? Automatically. Oh, you Hezbi too then. Subhanallah. This is the way of the Haddadiyyah. So these are some of the manifestations. If you don't agree with them, then, then, then you will become Hezbi as well. We think this one is a Hezbi. Anyone who don't say that this one is a Hezbi, then they Hezbi too. Now your whole community, Hezbi. Now the masjid, Hezbi. Now the school, Hezbi. So now we need what? Now we need another masjid. 
of real Salafis. We need another school of real Salafis. We need another website of real Salafis. <laughs> Why? Because y'all them ain't real Salafis. You know, people play these games, these semantic games, and you're like, who's your, who's your teacher? Who are you playing these games like this? When you say a person's not a real Salafi, then what that mean? A real, if he's not real Salafi, that means he's a fake Salafi. A fake Salafi means he ain't really Salafi. <laughs> but then you're going to still come and say, well, no, he ain't saying tap there. So, so then what are you saying? It's something new? I don't understand. But these are the games in which individuals play. Which brings me to the next the next topic on Allah Musta'in is so much to say. Allah Musta'in. But this is why, and this is an important point, I want to mention this point. Uh, Sheikh Al Albani, Imam Al Albani, he mentions about Mahmoud Al Haddad, which is important why we really have to learn our religion and learn what is a Salafiyya, learn the Minhaj of the Salaf. We have to learn it. Because, and before getting into the next point, that I, I think is very vital to mention. Sheikh Al-Bani, he mentioned, um, and I want you to pay attention because we're not going to be able to talk about everything today. It's not possible. Um, and if we continue this for many more days, it's going to take a lot more than that to really have an understanding by way in which you're able to defend yourself from the likes of the foolishness in which these people have fallen into. But in any event, Sheikh Abadi, he mentioned about Mahmoud al-Haddad, the founder of the Haddadiyya. The Sheikh, he mentions, he says, Huna yadhar lakum ahamiyat al-tamassuk bi minhaj al-salaf. He said, here it should be clear to you, because the Sheikh, he was mentioning some characteristics of Mahmoud al-Haddad. And then after that, he mentions, he went on to say, so now it should be, very clear to you the importance of sticking to the methodology of the Salaf. This person who, Mahmoud al Haddad, he said he left this. He left this. And he bases everything on his understanding. Not the understanding of the Salaf, not the understanding of the Imams of old. But based upon his understanding, the Sheikh Abani he says, "Bifahmihi al kitabi wa sunnah, fadhla dhalan baida." He said, and thus he went far astray. He went far astray. And the Sheikh he mentions, he says, "Wa amthaluhu kuthur fi kulli asr." He said, and this the, the the example of this person then there are many in every time you find him in every era you find a bunch of people that have done this but if you can and in all places you find people uh in every country every continent what have you you find people doing the likes of these particular things so it's not an anomaly at all which increases the tragedy of people becoming confused by it but that's only due to the fact of them being ignorant about their methodology with that, let's go back to their characteristic of making tabdir of anyone who don't make tabdir on those who they make tabdir of or calling a hizbi those who they don't call a hizbi of and so on and so forth and the separation that comes from that. Now we need a new masjid. Now we need a new, a new school. Now we need a new, you know, whatever, right? Uh, to the point of new people to hang with. There are certain situations where a brother will have a fall out of his wife. She don't agree with him. And I don't mention names, but this is real life stuff. That uh, the brothers in them have decided that this particular person is like this. The wife says, "Well, based on what I know, that's not accurate." So then the husband say, "Oh, if it's like that, then you divorce." It's real life story. It's happened. So sometimes, not only they got they need a new master, need need a new school. Sometimes need new wife, need new spouse. They ain't on it. So this points you to another characteristic that is a very distinguishing characteristic of the Hadadiyya. During the matter they mentioned, أَنَّهُمْ لَا يُرَاعُونَ مصالح ولا مفاسد. Is that they do not take into consideration the pros and cons, the benefits and the harms. 
They don't take any of that into consideration. Everything, again, is what? Black and white based upon their ghulu. If it's not like that, then it must be like this. There's only one is only one size fits all, and that's it. That's what they believe that the, the religion is. And that is not the, that is not the deen. The deen is not like that. But you look at what are the consequences, what will be the repercussions, what are going to be the ramifications of said course of action. Because whatever you can't stop, then you minimize it. This is from the principles of the religion. If you can't stop it, you minimize it. Because what? You can't always stop it. Sometimes you're in a situation where you can't stop it. Sometimes you're in a situation that's not ideal. You can't bring about the ideal set of circumstances. So what do you do? So then you, you do the best that you can with what's, what's been given to you. Right? I'll give you, I'll give you one practical example so that it really can hit home and we can understand. Is that you're not going to be able to name the innovator when refuting them everywhere. Some places you can name him. Because it won't cause more, more harm. Because Ahlul Sunnah are strong. And inshallah ta'ala, we're going to see a, an example of this from Imam Ahmed. So you can interact in a way that is different. So you can name them. But there are going to be other places where Ahlul Bid'ah, they're strong. Ahlul Sunnah is not strong there. They're weak there. Ahlul Bid'ah is strong. Maybe the particular individual from, the, from, from Ahlul Bid'ah that you are refuting, maybe they are... They have high status. They may have high status in that, in that particular society. They may be beloved to the people. And people get attached to personalities, so they're not going to hear what you're saying. They just know you're speaking about a personality that is beloved to them. So in a situation like that, do we say, no, it's from the Sunnah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a real Salafi, so I'm going to say it. I don't care. Is that from the Sunnah? Or in that situation, will you what? Refute the innovation. And leave the man name out of it. Leave the name out of it. Refute the innovation. Teach the principles of the Sunnah. Educate the people. Because Bidnilahi Ta'ala, Allah guide them. They will come to understand later. Ah, so and so does stuff like this. No, we can't. Right? But it's but 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 it is like, for example, sometimes people get a better lesson when they see for themselves sometimes people they don't you can't tell them they're not going to hear it it may push them more in the other direction so if you know this is a situation then what then you talk to them so that they can see it for themselves but you just don't tell them straight up why because the, the situation is not conducive for that there are other people who if you tell them and hit things to them it will enrage them it will make them mad because they'll say, I like it straight, just tell me straight up. Don't beat around the bush, just tell me. So an individual like that, will you speak by proxy or will you speak directly? You'll speak directly. Because just like not every individual is the same, not every situation is the same. So there's certain things, for example, you can say in Saudia that you can't say that in UAE. There's certain things you can say in UAE, you can't say in America. Right or wrong? The flip, you know, the flip flopping and flim flamming and shucking and jiving that the Yaqeen Institute is doing with the LGBT community and so on and so forth. A large portion of that is because they're trying to get, or it seemed like, because I don't know what's in their heart, but it seemed like they're trying to appeal to the masses and not do anything that's going to make them look intolerant or crazy, or whatever the case is, or whatever. Now, whether they believe this or not, Allahu Alam, I don't know what's in their heart. But an individual living in many parts of Africa, for example, you don't have to worry about that. At all. Because their stance on the LGBT community is in line with the Islamic stance. We don't tolerate it. We don't support it. We don't advocate it. In any which way, shape, or form. Period. We are not allowed to do it because we heard the ayat that we opened up with. Allah Ta'ala says haram is haram. Allah Ta'ala punished those people. Khalas, that's it. The Prophet Sallallahu he said it's haram. He told us what to do. When we find individuals committing actions like this. So we're not going to come back and say anything else. Or they have rights to get married. Says who? Allah Ta'ala says they don't. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Or a man and a woman and a woman. Oh, a man and a woman and a woman and a woman. Right? Because a man can have one, two, three, four, right? Wives, right? <laughs> right? 
That's marriage between males and females. That's it. A woman can't marry a woman and call it marriage. A man can't marry a man and call it marriage. Just like a woman can't marry two men and call it marriage. She can't say, oh, them treat them my husband. What? Not in our religion. Not in our Sharia. You can only have one husband. How come he can have four? Call on says so. It's very simple. If you want to go through the wisdom, then we can talk about some of the wisdom and the benefits you get from that legislation. But why? Because Allah said so. That's why. What do you mean? We don't question that. That's like a person coming and saying, how come Fajr is, is, is two raka'at? Because it is. How come Vuhr four? Let's make it three. No, it's four. Why? Because it is. Very simple. That's it. In any event. So that's why we don't play those type of games when it comes to these type of things. But anyway, the Hadadiyya, going back, they don't look at the harms and the benefits. It is from the religion that the repelling or the, yeah, the repelling of an evil, it takes precedence over the bringing about of a good. Right? You with me? What shows you that what? Things are not black and white. Sometimes you can't do this. So, it, so you have to fall back and do that. What's an example of this? As it comes in the hadith of our mother Aisha. Well, you have to look at the consequences and the outcome. When the Prophet said, Salam, he told to her. I'm like trying to give y'all hints. <laughs> when the, no, no, I didn't hear it. What did you say? No, not that one. It has to do with the Kaaba. That there are certain times when you can't do certain things due to what it may result in. Although you may have a reason or you may have, it may be legitimate for you to do it. But if, if it could potentially lead to harm, then you don't do it. So sometimes you will, you will hold back from doing something that is good, righteous, and right. Why? Because it may translate into harm where people may not understand given the situation. Was it dealing with the foundation of the Kaaba? It was dealing with the Kaaba. When he wanted to, um, oh, sorry, he wanted to, he wanted to rebuild it. He wanted to break it down and rebuild it, put in two doors so people can come and people can go. But he told our mother Aisha that if your people were not new to Islam, I would do this. But he didn't do it. Why? Because they were new to Islam. So if he did that, they wouldn't understand. Which may cause them to do what? Leave Islam. So he didn't do it. You look at the harms and the benefits. What, another situation where we learned, we learned from the deen. Yeah, subhanAllah. Is, yeah. <laughs> another, another, another one is that another example of sometimes something could be legitimate but due to what it may result in you can't do it is linked to the false deities the false gods not destroying it but what Allah Ta'ala forbids us from doing something Speaking out against, speaking out against their uh, belief. Uh, connected. What, what you, what, in the back, say what? Cursing the Tahoe. Cursing, cursing or, or verbally abusing their deities. Now, I'm saying both are saying the same thing, right? Verbally abusing their deities. Allah Ta'ala, he tells us, Wala to subbu. Do not speak ill. Don't speak ill, don't verbally abuse, speak in disrespectful terms about those who are called upon other than Allah. Why? Now, nah, there you go. But it's both now nah, that's true too. But because they will speak ill of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So you speaking ill of their false deity. Will cause them to in turn what speak ill of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Naam. So you, in essence, have become the reason that they spoke bad about Allah because you verbally abused their, 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 their false God. And, you know, in retaliation, then they verbally spoke bad about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, is it legitimate to speak in disrespectful terms about false deities? Yeah, it's legitimate because they're false deities. They're worshiping falsehood. It's erroneous. They don't deserve anything from worship. They're weak. They control nothing. They're unaware, inanimate, or dead. So on and so forth. So it's, yeah, we can say a lot about them and it's legitimate. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing, ain't nothing uh, hidden from that. But Allah Ta'ala tells us, don't do it. Why? Because it may, because of what it may result in. So now when you look at the way of the Haddadiyah, you find that they don't employ the likes of these things. They don't look into the harms and the benefits, even though they say what we're doing is justified. Now, again, I'm speaking in circumstances and situations where it is legitimately justified. I'm not talking about what the Haddadiyah and them do where it is almost never justified. They claim that it's justified, but it is not. So if you can't do it when it is justified, meaning if you can't act in a reckless manner when it is justified, how in the world are you allowed to act in a reckless manner when it is not even justified? Let me give you an example. How many youth are we losing? How many youth are we losing to the streets? How many youth have joined bloods and gangs and, uh, you know, bloods and crips and all these type of gangs and so on and so forth? Fighting and killing their Muslim brothers because they're on the other side of the gang to prove their loyalty to a gang. But these Muslim children that, that we are losing, how many of them really grew up in a community that reinforce their Islamic identity? How many of them went to a good school that educated them about their religion? How many? Hmm? Now I'm asking y'all, because y'all in Philly. Y'all have one of the most highest concentrations of Muslims in America. So I'm asking the brothers in Philly, in Philly, how many quality schools and educational institutions do we have for our children? Halal recreation for our children. Environments, libraries for our children that will rear them up, uh, upon the dean, showing them how to maneuver in this world where they don't feel like they're missing out on nothing. Zero. How many we got here in Philly? Zero. Very few, right? But how many Muslims we got here in Philly? No, Muslims. Oh, school, zero. But how many Muslims we got here in Philly? A ton of Muslims. Plethora of Muslims. How many Muslims in Philly upon Sunnah? A lot. How many women you can see fully garbed, beautifully dressed outside of Philly? A lot. Is it, is it weird to find a fit? No. How many thobs you see walking down the street in Philly and beards in Philly? A lot. And we still losing our children? You know part of the reason why that is? Is because of haphazard decisions and choices that are made that do nothing but weaken us. A short term victory that done cost you the war. Do you know how hard it is to keep restarting? Huh? Now this is applicable to all of us. So some people get upset. Yeah, I'm talking about you. Because I'm talking about me too. And if I could talk about me, then I could talk about you. Do you know how hard it is to have to keep restarting? We don't raise all this money now. We don't alhamdulillah, we didn't start establish the mash This and that and that. Alhamdulillah, everybody's supposed to know everybody's selling fee. Now all of a sudden somebody say that this one is not selling fee no more. And I'm not talking about like the Yahya al-Hajuri. I ain't talking about that. 
I'm not talking about people that clearly fell into things. No, I'm talking about the likes of Suleiman Ruhaili. Huh? I'm talking about the, the likes of these type of Mashaykh, Abdul uh, Sheikh Abdul um, Abdul Razak, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin, the likes of these ulama. But because of stances and things like that, oh no, we need a new masjid now. So now what does that do in practical terms? What does that do practically? Is that that's going to set you back. Because anybody that now will separate, I tell you brothers, you know what these, these mans in them? They upon his beer. They, they, they talking about this sheikh who, you know, we saying not Salafi no more uh, or don't take knowledge from him. They still talking about taking knowledge from him. They still teaching his books. They still, yeah, like this. So we got to open up a new spot. So y'all come and leave with me to open a new spot. What's that going to do? It separates the people. It does. But I'm talking more so from a standpoint of progress. What's that going to do progress-wise? It prolongs it because it does what? It sets us back. Because we got to start over. We had a place. Now we got to find a place. It was already renovated. Now we got to renovate something. We had some money in the bank. Now we ain't got nothing in the bank. So it's going to set us back. Four or five years, easy, right? It's going to take us how long to get back to where we were? Now, if you keep doing this repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly, why you think in 20 years we ain't get nowhere? If you, if, if, if you take one step forward, two steps back, you keep doing that for 20 years, then you're wondering, I I'm only really walk 20, 20 yards. How come? What do you mean, how come? In reality, you walked a whole lot more yards than that, but a lot of them was in the wrong direction. But all of this comes from being reckless. All of this comes from not looking at the harms and the benefits. Now, let me make this clear. Before I go to this example of Imam Ahmed, let me take this quick interlude to make this clear. I am not a follower of Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi. So let's, let's put that to rest. Because some people, them, they come and they say, oh, but they, they follow they, their Sheikh. Sheikh Muhammad Hadi is from my mama Sheikh, but I don't follow him. I'm not a follower of Sheikh Rabir. He's from my Sheikh, but I don't follow him. Because the reality of it is, is that anyone who knows me, they know that I'm not a follower of Imam Ahmed. Although I'm Hanbali, yes, but I don't blind follow Imam Ahmed. I love and I respect all of the ulama, but I don't blind follow not near one of them. They're not my leader. Imam Ahmed is not my leader. Sheikh Rabir is not my leader. Some people begin uncomfortable you hear stuff like that. Oh, what you mean? He's not my leader. What do you mean? What do you mean what I mean? No, he's not my leader. If I said Imam Ahmed is not my leader, no one bats an eye. If I said Imam Malik is not my leader, no one bats an eye. If I say that Imam Shafi is not my leader, no one bats an eye. If I say Imam Abu Hanif is not my leader, no one bats an eye. So why are you feel uncomfortable if I tell you Sheikh Rabir is not my leader? He's not. Why do you feel uncomfortable if I tell you Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi is not my leader? He's not. My leader is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's what I'm trying to be on. If that's not what you want, then I ain't on what you want. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They don't put nobody words in front of his. Period. That's what I'm on. Cause that's what some Salafia. But from the way the Hadidiyah you know, Mahmoud al Haddad, their Mashaykh and them, that's what they make Wala and Bara on. I don't do that. Anyway, back to the, the uh, back to the example. Sheikh Islam Taimi he mentioned that Imam Ahmed, when he was in Baghdad, he used to in, in Baghdad in his time the Sunnah was and you know, the Sunnah was 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 prevalent. They had strength. When he was there, he used to be hard against the the, the uh, Murji'ah. He used to be shidda. He employed shidda against the Murji'ah. Because the shit that's from the deen, sometimes dealing with people in a harsh manner is appropriate and it's from the religion. That's not all the time. Sometimes it is. Right? So when he was in Baghdad, he was hard against the Murji'ah. But the same Imam Ahmed, Rahimullah Ta'ala, when he went to Khurusan and to other places, he was not hard against the Murji'ah. Why? Because the people of the Sunnah there were weak. So it wasn't from wisdom to be hard against them there. See, in 
in Baghdad to be hard against them, it was a good lesson. It helped them come back to the truth. But in Khurasan and other places, to be hard against them was ineffective because they were strong. So then he didn't employ that tactic there because it wasn't appropriate. Because he looked at the harms and the benefits. That makes sense? And lastly, and there's so much more. They gave, they said, they told me extra 10 minutes. I, I apologize so much. I apologize, or well, extra time, and then we're going to take 10 minute break. But I apologize for taking more than the allotted time. But just lastly, and this is an encouragement for myself, it was mentioned before, but I think it's very important that it's mentioned again that from the characteristics of the Hadadiyya that people have mistaken for a Salafiyya is Al Insiraf Amma Yanfa is that they turn away from that which is more beneficial. They turn away from beneficial knowledge, they turn away from learning, they turn away from things that will benefit them, and they spend their time, the majority of their time, is spent in qila wa qal. He said, she said. Talking about this one, talking about that one, so on and so forth. Right? And this is from the most destructive of characteristics is, is to be a gossiper, always talking about this one, that one. This shake so and so said about that shake such and such. This shake so and so ain't like this shake such and such. So on and so forth. Now, I'm, to the point where, and I'm again, this, this is an example. You could tell me, maybe I'm wrong. You tell me. Individuals will be well, for example, let's take uh, Sheikh Muhammad bin Hadi and Sheikh Rabir. Let's take their situation. Some people will know the insides and the outs about that. Right? They don't know what Sheikh said what, this one said this one, that other Sheikh said that one, so on and so forth. But then, if you ask them about the shuruq of salat, they don't know. You ask them what are the arkan of salat, they don't know. What about ahkam wudu in detail, in a manner in which you could teach somebody? They don't know. And I'm bringing these two things up, why? Because these are two things that we do multiple times a day, every single day. So if you don't know about things that you have to know about, like the like the ahkam tahar and wudu and so on and so and and ahkam salat, how in the world are you so versed in this stuff that you don't need to know about? I I, I don't understand. And why are you busying the people with this when there are more important things for them to know? And I brought this as 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 as, as an example because a real life example. Again, these not these not no made up stories. In West Palm Beach, an individual he came to me and he said, "Listen, I just came out of such and such, and I ain't gonna mention them because they ain't worth it. But I came out of such and such, and they said they was talking about this big thing going on right now. It's a big fitna. It's like the fitna of the khalq of the Quran. It's serious like that. And this, this, that, and this. And um, you know, and he started mentioning certain aspects of the fitna and so on and so forth. Then he looked at me and he said. Yo, who's um? He said, uh, yeah, it's about yeah, about Muhammad bin Hadi. This is that, that, and that. So I said, I'm listening, okay. And then after saying all that, he, you know what he said to me? He said, but, uh, can I ask you something? I said, yes, sure. He said, Who, who's Muhammad bin Hadi? Who's that? <laughs> I said, what? I said, Ahi, really? You don't know who that is? No. I said, so why are they busying you with something the person you didn't even know exist? You didn't even know he exists. Why are they telling you about him? And I know this brother. This brother needs to learn about more other stuff. So why 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 are you being busy with this? This is not gonna help you. You don't even know you didn't even know he existed as an individual. And then you don't even understand the the, the issue. So why are they busy you with this making you take a position? It's beyond me. Then he came and he said, but Y'all brothers here, y'all don't really be getting into it. I said, yeah, because y'all don't even know who he is. <laughs> Why am I going to busy you with that for? You don't even know who he is. I'm not going to talk about that. We have to, learn, have to learn what the sunnah is. What's more important here, teach the, you know, a sunnah sunnah. That's what's more important here. Lumati atiqad. That's what's more important here. All this is from Busying themselves in qila wa qal. Don't be from people who speak about Salafiyyah. Be from people who are Salafi, who know about Salafiyyah. That's very, very, very important. And again, 
I even scratched the surface really of a lot of what I wanted to mention. But bi ta'ala, there will be other opportunities later on down the line that they will be mentioned. bi ta'ala, fa-naktafi bi al-qadr. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wa jazakumullahu khayra.